Everyone, let's give a round of applause to Kevin Hearn. So I know I probably don't need to say too much to you about him, but I'm going to anyway. So he is the author of the Iron Druid series, uh, the Seven Kenning series, one of my favorite series, the Kingdom of Zappel books, uh, which... The first one, Kill the Farm Boy, is a personal staff pick of mine. Um, and also the, um, oh my good, the, the two books that are also set in the Iron Druid series. I always forget their, I always mix their names. Ink and Sigil. Ink and Sigil, yes. I always mix them up in weird ways. <laughs> We're so thankful again to have you here, Kevin. We really appreciate this. And I'm pretty sure everyone tuning in virtually and in person is also thankful. Um, and don't forget, uh, after the discussion portion, I'm going to have a little bit also for a Q&A. So I hope you all get your questions ready. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, this, this is very, it's an extra large microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, it's awesome to be here again. Last time I was through, it was a while back. Um, I, I, I stopped coming to Comic-Con and I won't be coming again to any cons. I'd rather do this kind of thing because everybody's a little bit safer. Um, I, I, I take off my mask for this part of it, but then I'll put it back on for the signing bit. Um, and uh, this is my fourth tour this year. Uh, and I'm still, you know, virus free because you're limiting, you know, your exposure this way. Um, it, when you're in a convention, and there's just too much, you know, uh, unrestrained stuff. And, and then the mask, they might have a mask policy, but, you know. It doesn't get enforced after a while. So anyway, this is what I'm comfortable doing now. And uh, plus, I like to support bookstores rather than giant conventions. So uh, and plus, at a convention, whenever I do a signing event there, it's so fast and impersonal. You're, you're herded through and you get like maybe five seconds with a person and then you're on to the next one. So with this one, I, I really like it a lot more because I can talk to y'all and I can answer questions you might have. Um, and uh, it's just it's just more positive all the way around. I just dig it. So um, I'll keep coming back to Mysterious Galaxy whenever I can uh, because it's an awesome store. But the last time I was here was, uh, I think, 2016 or something like that. I was, I was doing a, a tour for Hunted. It was a very long time ago. So uh, on that particular tour, I started here, and then I drove up the coast to Seattle. Uh, and this time I, I went the other way. I started in Seattle and came down this way. So uh, super happy to be here because of the fact that we got to do these reissued Iron Druid Chronicles. Um, the fact that I get to have any kind of reissue at all is just a testament to you all for uh, reading and spreading the word. Um, but I'm super grateful because not only is the artwork amazing um, from this cover artist, this is the same cover artist who did the Ink and Sigil stuff. Uh, she's uh, Her name is Sarah Coleman, and she does... Um, uh, all of this stuff is hand drawn. She doesn't do anything with a computer. She's like an ink wizard, period. So the fact that she got to do the ink and sigil stuff, she's like, I was born to do this book. <laughs> Although she doesn't sound like that. <laughs> she sounds very British. Um, and, and so then we said, well, we love that so much. And that's in the Iron Druid world. We need to redo the Iron Druid covers. Why don't we have her, you know, do the refresh on, on the series? And so it, it wound up just being perfect. We loved it. And uh, the other thing that I love about the opportunity to do these is that I finally got to do things in the order that I wish to. I got to include short stories and novellas that had been scattered all over the places in, in anthologies and stuff like that. And sometimes people just missed them. It was hard for them to catch up, whatever. Um, but now everything is included in these editions. You get the short stories and the novellas in chronological order. And then you also get some bonus stuff like that I wrote for the very first time. And it's the, the first time seen anywhere. Um, it won't ever be an audio, for example, because since it's bonus stuff that I did for free, because that's, that's how desperately I wanted to write them. I'll do it for free. And they're like, okay, free is good. That's a great price. But, but they can't do that for audio, right? Because you have to hire Luke Daniels to do the narration, but then they can't charge you anything for it because it's bonus. So corporately, <laughs> that can't happen. They can't go pay for something and never make a return on their investment. So that's why we'll, the, the bonus stuff in here, some of it will never be in, in audio. So one of them is, is Oberon's Religion for Dogs. When in Trapped, he talks about the dead flea scrolls and how he's going to write them someday for his religion called Poochism. Okay? <laughs> And I finally got to write it. So so that is in the back of Trapped. And I was going to read you a little bit, some short bits from it. Um, 
And I, I should warn you uh, at the front end, if, if you are uh, an audiobook reader, uh, then I don't sound anything like Luke Daniels. And uh, for he doesn't actually um, voice Oberon the way that I hear him in my head anyway, which is fine. That's the way it should be, right? Everybody's going to have their own imaginary voices when they read. And I love what he does. Uh, it cracks me up whenever I listen to it. But it's also, like, not what I imagine when I'm writing. So um, it'll be a little bit different, uh, and I hope you'll uh, put up with me uh, so while I do this. But uh, I'm going to read you a little bit from the Scroll of Sirius, the, just the very first chapter. And, and also, because uh, I'm a smart aleck, um, I, I numbered these like chapter and verse like the Bible, so you can actually quote it like Bible verses. So, so you could go, you know, Sirius 1 colon 2 or whatever like that. And I hope you do. I hope you. I just want to see these memed everywhere. And people are like, "What scripture is that from?" <laughs> well, it's from the Dead Flea Scrolls, sir. All right. In the beginning, all kinds of wild stuff happened, but none of that really matters. Like who started it, or when did it begin, or why even bother, or how does that work? Because the fact is that we're all here now, and there are cows to eat, asses to sniff and plenty of humans who will voluntarily rub our bellies. Beyond that, many humans like to fight over what happened in the beginning, even killing each other over who started it. And we can all agree that such behavior is very bad, and there is no need to duplicate it. Much of the killing amongst humans revolves around the proper name of God, with which we need not be concerned. The reflection of God is dog, sometimes called Sirius but also known by many other names over which, over which we will never fight and kill each other. Sometime after the very beginning, when God had already made planets and stars and set down rules for the universe like physics and where to go to the bathroom and who would clean up our poop, not us, God made sausage. And at that point, the universe became bearable, perhaps even hopeful. The sausage of God was made from pure mystery. One does not inquire how the sausage was made or what ingredients make up its substance, for such questions distract us from the glory of its taste and the magnificence of the gift. Therefore, I say, ask nothing of your sausage. Accept it as a blessing, and there will be joy. So that's just the first like, chapter of the scroll of Sirius, and there are several more of those. There's also the scroll of Kennels, the scroll of Fluffy, the scroll of Max, um, <laughs> which is the most popular dog name. Do you guys know that? Uh, and then, and you know, the the scroll of Sausage, of course. So there's a whole bunch of fun stuff in here. Some of it uh, poignant, some of it very sad. Some, you know, it covers a lot of things in just a few pages. Uh, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, the, the scroll of Max is one that I was going to read, but um, I see that there are some young people here tonight. And Oberon sometimes talks about things that are not really appropriate for younger audiences. So I, there's this in the back of Trapped. The other stuff that's brand new is um, Grand Newell's notebook in the back of Staked because she had a running, like a, a, a long standing question about vampire biology <laughs> Do vampires poop? And she finally got an answer. But that was not the only question she had about vampire biology. So she had filled up a notebook with them. And so that is in the back of state for your enjoyment. I had a lot of fun doing that because uh, there's illustrations too. Um, so uh, then uh, in the back of uh, Shattered, uh, in Shattered, Oberon said uh, to Atticus that he was going to write a cookbook called The Book of Five Meats. So... That's in the back of Shattered. So, so yeah, you guys got a lot of cool stuff uh, with these particular uh, editions. And again, I have to thank you for making it all possible um, because not everybody gets the chance to have their series redone like this. And I'm just turbo grateful that I basically now have like a director's cut, you know, and I can forever look at these and go, aha, that's, that's good. Um, especially since like in Hounded for, for, for 10 years, this has been bugging me. Uh, near the end of Hounded, Atticus says that a certain character who passed away got her just desserts, but they left out an S, and it says she got her just deserts. And it's been, I, I, I'd go to sleep at night, seriously. I, I, I'd be sitting there going, it still says just deserts in there. Everybody thinks I don't know the difference between deserts and desserts. 
So I finally got to fix it. <laughs> I sleep so much better now. So, um, so a lot of little things like that got fixed, uh, whether they were typos or whatever. All that stuff is now fixed. These, these are seriously awesome additions. And, uh, of course, they're gorgeous, and so they look great on your shelf. And uh, that was another thing. It's like there's inconsistent uh, look to the paperbacks because, like, at, at book seven, they switched. They put my name at the top instead of at the bottom, and so it, it threw everything off, and everybody was mad, including me. Uh, so now everything is nice and consistent. looks gorgeous. So. So um, besides this, what else have I been doing? Well, um, on on the Friday or the Thursday before I got on the plane to fly off to Seattle, I turned in A Curse of Krakens, which is the third book of the Seven Kennings trilogy. And uh, that's kind of my baby. That's honestly the, the series that I'm really super proud of. Um, for those of you who have never tried it, or, or, or maybe you're just not into epic fantasy, but if you've never tried my, uh, my Seven Kennings stuff, it's, um, it's my attempt to kind of take the experience of Homer's uh, Iliad or Odyssey and update it for modern audiences. Because what we're trying to do here is tell a truly epic story of war, but it's told by a bard every night in a few installments to a live audience. Okay, So obviously I can't do that the way Homer did it, but I, I kind of recreate that. So the bard is able to, his magical ability is to take on the seeming of his narrators. So there's a total of 22 first person narrators in this epic fantasy trilogy. To my knowledge, that has never been done before. You've, you've seen like narrators in third person, and you might have seen a lot of narrators in third person. I, you know, George Martin does a great job of that. Here's a whole bunch of people, but you've not seen it in first. Uh, nobody's done it before as far as I know. So that was a, a mountain I wanted to climb. Um, and it was, I also wanted to just write, if I'm creating a world, uh, a second fantasy world, it's not our world at all. Why does it need to have some of the more terrible aspects of this one? <laughs> so my books do not contain slavery or sexual assault. It's just not part of the world. Um, so that's there. Also, the characters are not all 20-somethings. Um, there are characters who are over 60. There are people all, you know, all over the place in terms of their ages, uh, their relationship status, you know, their, their backgrounds, period. So it's not all just, here's a, here's a farm boy. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he's secretly the king, whatever. None of that stuff is going on. I wanted to do a very different epic fantasy. So if you want to try something different than epic fantasy, please try the Plague of Giants and uh, get ready for, you know, the second one is already out. It's called The Blight of Black Wings, which I believe right now is the best book I've ever written uh, until the Crest of Krakens comes out. Yay! Um, so, uh, yeah, my, my editor got me my notes back today on the Curse of Krakens. And it was very tiny, which was awesome. Um, my editorial letter for A Plague of Giants, because it was so new, it was like, this is a structural thing nobody's done before. I had a 24-page editorial letter of stuff to fix. This one was two. And, and, and so she's like, it's really weird to have such a short letter for what is your longest book. <laughs> but you've obviously figured some things out and you know we just have a few things that we need to address so i'm like Woo I'm, I'm rocking and rolling ready to go so after i get done with that i'm writing a developer for subterranean press um that's going to be set in oregon and then i am writing the third book of the ink and sigil series so that's like my schedule of you know what i get to do for work you know going forward and hopefully i'll have some more things to announce to you soon um so that that's me you know uh I'm, I, I would love to be able to take some questions from y'all. And, and then sometimes, Nick, do you guys have like questions sometimes from, from out there too? So cool. Um, please, I, I, I got to warn you that when you ask me stuff, I tend to, to answer at length. You probably get a lot more than, than you, you bargain for. But um, this is a technique that, that the kids figured out when I was teaching. They would ask me stuff. I'm like, hey, I don't want to you know, learn whatever he had scheduled. I'll learn something else. I'll just ask him a question and see what happens. So uh, it's, a, it's a typical strategy that a lot of teachers are familiar with, and students are too. You'll figure out which teachers uh, will go off topic very quickly, and then they'll take advantage of that. So anyway, ask me whatever you guys would like. Um, I'm happy to discuss any of the series or other series or books that you should be reading that are not mine, uh, all that good stuff. I would start with a bone giant, I'm sorry, the, the bone shard daughter by um, Andrea Stewart. 
It's fantastic. Um, that is the Drowned World trilogy. The second book is already out, The Bone Shard Emperor, and the third book will be out early next year because she's just finished all of her edits on it. It's gorgeous. And you have it here, right? Yes. Talk to, hey, is Max here? Hey, what's up, man? I'm buying that for you. Okay. I've, I've, I've already I've already had them set aside a copy for you so that I'm, I'm going to buy, be buying it for you and giving it to you tonight. All right, so you guys got some questions for me? Yes, in the back. Oh, my God, hi. Um, oh, my God, hello. Oh my God. Um, so I just had a question about um, in your, the latest in Consigil book, you sort of touched on Atticus's, like, ableism um, and him losing his arm and everything, and I feel like as an author, especially a fantasy author, you've gone out of your way to, you know, like you said, not mention slavery or like, you know, bring some of the worst parts of our world into a fantasy setting. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of like, I guess your main drive in like doing that? You mean the epic stuff or, 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 or we talk about paper and blood? I'm sorry. I'm not or just like in your writing in general. I think you oh, are yeah. really good at being inclusive and inclusionary oh. without being, I don't know, unnecessarily problematic. Oh, th thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, well, part of that is probably because uh, of the background of, of being a teacher. Um, we were very much aware of people who, well, they learn in different ways, right? And um, if you are a one-size-fits-all person and you don't accept anything except what's you know what you're used to, um, well, that's not going to be the best situation for everybody. And um, you, you basically want to tailor whatever it is you're doing, whether you're teaching or whether you're writing, to be as accessible to everybody as possible, and um, so that everybody can enjoy it. And after all, everybody is part of the world, so uh, you know, to to purposely exclude folks seems a little bit. If you, if you you know, a lot of times when people are making excuses for what they for the for the problematic stuff they put in there, say, well, we're just trying to be realistic. And I'm like, no, actually, you're not, because uh, it's more realistic to include everybody, <laughs> because everybody is really here. Um, so, uh, plus, if you were going to be realistic about stuff, then why isn't everybody like, you know, sleeping in fleas and pooping themselves and stuff like that? You know, so, so if you, yeah, if they want to make the historical argument, let's go with all the history and not just the parts you seem to be fixated on, right? So, um, yeah, I've, I've always wanted to uh, try to um, tell stories. I mean, there, there's a line you have to walk, right? Because um, I don't want to tell other people's stories, but I want them to be included and recognized and stuff. And one of the reasons that you do second world fantasy is because um, you don't necessarily have um, all of the stuff, you know, the baggage that goes with doing stuff set in this world where you do have to be really, really careful about stuff. So, um, so for my urban fantasies, yeah, my protagonists are white folks, but I have other folks that are, um, you know, included there because they are in the world and uh but i don't want to tell their story so i have to tell the story of, of like I, what i typically wind up reading though is stuff that's not about white guys because i already know what that is uh <laughs> and i want i want the experience you know that's why i'm often reading you know i, I usually read women authors these days uh because uh they're gonna basically approach things from a different way than i ever would and that means i'm gonna grow when i read it so reading's all about empathy right so you got to get some by reading stuff that's not you. So that's why I, I do that. So there you go. Very long answer to your question. That's what happens. Yes, sir. I have a question about the process that you went through with Luke Daniels. Yeah. It seems to have gotten the feel of all the characters so well. Yeah. But it looks like you gave him some freedom, like you said, on Oberon. But yeah. how overall did that develop over time? Okay, uh, so the question is, yeah, about Luke Daniels and our relationship and, and so on. So when it first started, uh, this was kind of interesting because uh, at the time it started, this was like 2010, 2011, and it might not seem like it now, but audiobooks were not always the big thing that they are now. <laughs> and when I signed the contract, I'm like, audiobooks? There's a contract for audiobooks? I'm never going to make this money back. I was wrong, delightfully wrong, um, because audiobooks are now actually the majority of my income it's become such a huge part of my revenue stream. And that's honestly probably because of Luke Daniels and what an amazing job he's doing. Um, but at the time, audiobooks to me 
were the things that other English teachers pressed play on when they wanted to punish their students. You know, they were incredibly dry and boring and not well done. So I thought that that was not really something I was going to be into. I didn't realize that Luke existed. You know what I mean? I didn't know that audiobooks could be the really fun, dynamic thing that they are when performed by a professional actor. So um, when I first got, you know, I first heard the audiobooks that he was doing, I was delighted because, I mean, I was laughing at his delivery. Like, I already knew the joke. I wrote it, but I was still laughing at how he delivered it, right? Um, he made a few missteps because he's from Michigan, so he pronounced saguaro like saguaro, you know, a hard G. He did a couple of other little, little tiny things like that that were like kind of painful to a southwestern ear, but we fixed that later on, um, and we, we considered Consulted ahead of time, um, it, you know, especially for some of the Celtic names and stuff like that. There were or Gaelic names that were very difficult. Uh, let's make sure we get those right. But then eventually, I would mess with him um, because I would like pick a town in Poland that had like, you know, fifteen consonants and one vowel. <laughs> Because I could have picked anything. I could have picked something really easy to pronounce, but no, I picked Bidgosh, which is, so it has a sh, sh. That, that, that's really a thing that they do. So uh, it was fantastic. I did that on purpose. And he knows when he runs across it there too. He's like, oh, he's trying to get me. And, uh, but but he, he's got such a great attitude about it. He's like, bring it. I can do it, you know? So, um, yeah, he, he's he's fantastic. And uh, later on, we we did start to consult a little bit more and talk um, ahead of time. And um, then he's done, of course, some of my self published stuff for me as well. Uh, my self published audio, I should say. So uh, yeah, he's 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 just great. So uh, yes, we'll go ahead and take one virtual question right now. Sure. Um, this comes from Lisa. She wants to know what inspired Oberon's character and why sausage and why poutine. <laughs> Okay. Um, so the Iron Drew Chronicles really started with me wanting a talking dog. It started with Oberon. He was the first character I had. Um, and he was based on my own dogs. I had a pug and a Boston Terrier named uh, Manly and Sophie. And uh, they unfortunately, you know, it, it's it's 10 years later, they unfortunately passed away during the pandemic. Um, of old age, they were uh, very well loved, but uh, it was their time. Um, so, but they were the inspirations for Oberon because, of course, pugs and Boston Terriers are very expressive in their faces. And I could kind of always imagine that they were talking to me. Um, and uh, why sausage? Well, sausage is delicious. I mean, come on, it's like 85% fat. And then uh, what, what's the uh, what was the other thing? Poutine. Also, yeah, I kind of got into that once I got up to, to Canada, you know, and, and um, it you go to a poutinery and um, yeah, here's here's fries with cheese and gravy on it. But, but then you start to get into the loaded ones, you know, it's like, well, look, we're just going to start off with a minor coronary, but then we're going to upgrade you <laughs> to a major one. And, uh, yeah, they put all kinds of stuff on it now, fully loaded poutine, you know, so it's good times. Other questions? Yes. What are the ways that you are able to work through writer's block, or how do you get through the self-doubt and the crippling, oh, God, I can't stare at what I've written? Okay, so I, I like the part where you said, how do I get through it? Because that implies it exists, and it does. It never goes away. So you always have to figure out how to deal with it. At least I haven't met too many authors who are like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm totally confident in my abilities. Uh, most writers are very neurotic about it, you know. So um, I, I, I basically, you know, I've written a few books now. So I kind of go through the same cycles. And when I get to the part where I'm like, oh, this is shit. This is terrible. Kimberly, my wife, she's like, here we go again. <laughs> It's not shit. It's not. It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be good. You're gonna see. Trish will be love it, etc. Whatever. So, um, how do I get through all those things? The writer's block part. Um, I actually usually try to. Um, I, I, I kind of delve into a little bit of brain science here. Your your brain is organized to uh, make sense of the world and categorize things. Okay, because it's always co it's constantly looking for threats. That's why billboards work. Billboards are not a threat, but your brain can't stop looking at them anyway, and advertisers know this. So 
you're going down the road and you see something off peripherally. Oh, is that a dinosaur? You know, oh, shoot, it's a billboard again. But I accidentally read it. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so, but, but that's how your, your brain, you can't stop yourself from being that way. So that being the case, when you are in a writer's block or something like that, you are in a rut. You need something new. So I purposely go out and see something I've never seen before. I take a drive down a road I've never been or a, or a hike or a walk or whatever. Um, and in the process of doing that and seeing new stuff, my brain is firing in a way it, ha it gets out of – I'm forcing it to get out of the rut because now I'm in a new environment and it has to start categorizing everything as a threat or something good or, oh, that's pretty and i got to remember that for later, right? So, so this is – that's one of the things I do is just kind of take advantage of this – crippling thing that your brain does uh, and uh, you know, flip it around to your own benefit. That helps. So I always go out and get some exercise of one kind or another and try to see something new and then by the time I'm back to my spot, my brain is firing in a much better way than it was before. Yeah. All right. Yes. Another internet question. This comes from Charles Penn. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you've already answered this before, but what made you decide on an immortal druid for the main character? Oh, yeah. Uh, that was... Uh, okay, so once I had my talking dog, I needed somebody to talk to the talking dog. And I didn't want a witch or a wizard because they have this uh, familiar, this you know, master-servant relationship, and that is not the vibe I wanted at all. I wanted a, a much more friendly relationship. Um, so a druid sound like it would fit the bill for me, um, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of you know track records of Neo druids, neo pagan druids, being able to talk to animals. So I needed one of the old ones that supposedly had that ability to talk to animals. And uh, for that, I had to go back in time, and uh, you know, to when the the ancient druids were around, and uh, look at the pathology and see why would there be one of these ancient druids still alive today. And uh, fortunately, there were three different ways in Irish mythology for people to extend their lives. I was like, well, that was easy. I, like, <laughs> Thanks for the bonus extra ways to, to extend your life. I only needed one. She gave me three. Um, then, um, yeah, I, I had to come up with, you know, why would he be in hiding all of this time? You know, if he was so cool and could talk to animals, why hadn't we heard about him in history? And then it turned out that Fragara was this actual sword that the Tua de Danon gave to Khan of the Hundred Battles in the first century, and it was never returned. And so I thought, well, hey, my guy stole it, and he's been hiding ever since, and that's why we haven't heard from him. So it's like I actually used the old mythology to kind of, you know, create my character. Um, and that, that worked out well. So thanks, mythology. So there you go. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do Sparkly Mask and then right behind Sparkly Mask and then come up here to the front. Hello, Sparkly Mask. You probably have a much better name than that. Hello. Yes, it's Snow. Hi, uh, Snow. May, may you please tell me which is Oberon's favorite place he's ever gone hunting with Atticus? Oh, gosh. That's a really good question. Um, it... <laughs> Okay, so this is my private thing. I, it, it's it's in Africa where the big dicks are. <laughs> so, yeah, dick, for those of you who do not know, dick dicks are very tiny antelope. D I K hyphen D I K, and of course, it's fun to say. And Oberon has a habit of liking things that are kind of double entendres and being very unconscious of them. And uh, Atticus loves that and never tells him that there's a, a different meaning. So uh, it's always a good time. So, yeah, the, the Dick Dicks are, are fast, but not too fast. And, and they're snack size. So, yeah, there you go. Fun, fun size, yeah. All right. Thank you, Snow. Hey, Max, what's up? Hi. <laughs> um, I first read your books, uh, of course, in German. And mm -hmm. uh, I heard them in German first, then I read them in German, then I read them in English again. <laughs> yeah. So that was quite a journey. How, how was that journey for you, translating your, your work from English to German or, or oh. other languages? How does that look for you? Okay, yeah, I don't do the translation part myself. I'm, I am not fluent in German at all. I know just a <laughs> tiny bit that I got from Duolingo before I went over there. <laughs> By the way, everybody, Max came here from Germany to be in Switzerland. Yeah. That's very so, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm sorry, Switzerland? Yes. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming so much. Um, and uh, 
the what I'm told is that the German translations are pretty darn good, uh, but of yeah. course some of the slang, you know, is not going to translate well. Um, and I've always kind of wondered about that, and especially at like like very recently with the Ink and Sigil books, like there's some pretty hardcore Scottish slang in there. And what are they doing to translate it? Turns out they're not. Uh, they're not really translating the slang. They're just using a completely different thing, or um, in some cases, there's just these really, really long German uh, substitutions for very short words in English. Yeah. And the one that I ran into when I went over there in July was asshat. <laughs> the, the, the translation for asshat went on for a while. It was a whole bunch of words. Um, and I had tried to have them, you know, explain to me what was going on there. Why did that two syllable word turn into such an, you know, an epic in itself? And they're like, well, yeah, it was it, German's weird, you know? And, <laughs> and, <laughs> so that's why the German translations are always so thick, you know, compared. So, um, but I, yeah, I, I, I'm trusting people when they say that it's good translation and um, and they're enjoying themselves. So, um, and I, and I hear that on the Southern Kennings translations that for audio they did a full cast recording, like they actually brought in a whole bunch of different people to read it. So that's kind of cool. And then the guy who does apparently the audio books in German is somebody who's kind of a big deal in Germany. Yeah, I, uh, I read your books because of him. Also, the, oh, well, Stefan cool. Stefan Kaminski is a very yeah, yes. <laughs> I saw I saw a video of him reading it in German. I'm like, God damn, that sounds awesome. Who wrote that? Oh, yeah, that was me. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he he's really good. So, yeah, I just got lucky on 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 the audio front, both in in English and German. So, thank you, appreciate it. Did I answer your question? Okay, yeah, okay. And then we have this this gentleman up front. Thanks for waiting. I was just wondering about the bookstore. If there was uh, inspiration for that beyond just being a teacher for the bookstore? Yeah. The, uh... Oh yeah, yeah. Um, well. I've been thinking a lot about this. Like, like there are businesses that you kind of think would be really cool, but then it, it's really the sense of place that you like more than the actual work in that place. Like, it would be cool to have a bar with a whole bunch of D and D themed things, um, but actually running the bar would not be as much fun as just being there. So, um, yeah, I, I think that I've always liked the, I've always liked walking into little indie bookshops and seeing how they're they're decorated and whether they have a dog or not inside um whether there's you know some kind of zen music playing and candles going on or wind chimes that, that was a good t that was a good time in that store um because you didn't always see them and then you're not gonna oh jesus you know um because then you get worried that like, like you weren't supposed to and it wasn't just part of the ambience like like you set off an alarm that's the first part about it. You know, then you realize, oh, that was supposed to be soothing, but it wasn't. Uh, so anyway, um, but I, yeah, I like going into a whole bunch of different stores. There was my, probably my favorite store was a, an old store in, in um, Flagstaff called the Radio Bookstore, and there was they had a husky shop dog, and that shop dog would lay down in front of the door, like just inside the door. Okay, just inside and would not move. Now it was not threatening, but it was like you're going to step over me. I'm not moving. This is this is, this is my spot. Where this, the sun hits. I'm sitting here. So it was always great. I always love it uh, going to that particular place because you. I just love dogs, and the, it greeted me with a dog when I came in. So you know what could be better. So um, yeah, that, there wasn't much more than that to it. Yeah. This Yeah. 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 The environmental stuff is is something I'm very concerned about. Um, Tricked in particular has a whole bunch. There's a whole plot line about the coal mines and, and the strip mining that was going on in the Navajo Nation. And I remember getting some some uh, you know blowback from that, like, "Yeah, you don't understand anything about that stuff." That I don't know why I'm thinking that that's the voice of those comments, but <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. The uh, the thing is, is that. I was predicting a, a whole bunch of this stuff. Not, not that I was alone in this at all. A lot of people, a lot of people have saw this 
you know, climate change coming for a long time and have been raising the alarm about it. And um, now it's all coming true and kicking us in the butt all over the place and um, much faster. That's the thing that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of is like, well, things are going to hell a lot faster than we expected. This particular ice sheet should have melted 50 years from now, but it's happening now anyway. You know, so that kind of pattern is happening. It's like, this is even worse than we thought. So, um, yeah, that that's kind of, I, I'm kind of bummed about that quite a bit, uh, how things are continuing to progress and not enough is being done. Um, and it's always been a part of it. Um, the Gladys, who has seen some shite character, is uh, actually, I've written uh, her origin story, and it will be out in a couple of months. If you guys are interested in ch chasing it down, it will be in an, an in an anthology and uh it's called unbound 2 and it's available from grim oak press for pre-order right now and obviously there will be a ton of other awesome stories in there from fantasy authors besides myself but what's kind of neato shmito about this particular anthology and this publisher is that they commission artwork for every story so there's a cool so the story is called gladys and the whale and um there's uh, a lovely illustration at the beginning of the story so i hope you guys check it out because it was a lot of fun for me to write um and uh gladys is one of my favorite new characters yeah yeah all right we have another question from charles uh have you ever read a night in lonesome october if so what do you think about the animal perspectives in that novel i haven't read it i'm sorry charles i don't mean to disappoint you there um, I'm sorry, I haven't read it. <laughs> I don't, never even heard of it. Sorry about that. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Any of y'all have one for me? Yes. Hi, sorry, me again. Oh, um, fine. <laughs> uh, so in the Seven Kenning series, um, I feel like you made it a point, like you were saying, to have a lot of like older, you know, different age range of characters. Mm -hmm. um, in the newest book, um, who can we expect to see the most of? Oh, wow. Okay. So Gondolved is obviously still uh, a major part of things, and he makes me laugh all the time. I love him. And then um, the new character, actually, is uh, that, that really became kind of a, a big deal um, is is younger. Her name is Penyas Penmin, and she would be a name you would recognize from A Plague of Giants. She was now Kits Bensa's um, cousin, who became a green sleeve. Um, and what she's trying to do is figure out, like, well, how do I deal with the legacy of my incredibly famous culture heroine cousin now? How do I grow out of the shadow of her canopy, and uh, and be somebody different? You know. Um, and, and so that's kind of her struggle and her journey. And then she's given the opportunity to do, do just that. And uh, wow, it's a lot of fun. So um, I had a blast writing her and especially some of the things that she's, she, she's obsessed with a particular foreignish poet. So I got to write poetry in the style of a foreignish person. And I just, yeah, I geeked out. So um, yeah, I, that's one of the things that you can look forward to. Also, Hollet Panovic, who is the Hathrim proprietor of the Roasted Sunchuck. She is going to be a uh, narrator. You're going to get a narrator who's actually from Ecula. Um, yeah, you get their perspective. Um, then you have uh, Kosha Gansu return. Um, and of course, she will be on the cover. Kosha will be the cover, uh, uh, the person featured on the cover. So um, she, she's a very big deal in the last book. So there you have it. I hope you guys dig it. Got another question from Lisa. Is What's there a up? location that you haven't written about that is on your list for the future? Ooh. Um, so yeah, kind of, sort of. I, I'm, the location scouting that I need to do for the third Ink and Sigil book will be in uh, near the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. Um, so the islands just, you know, they're off the coast of Scotland, and there's a strait of water in between those islands and the mainland. It's called the Minch. It's, a, you know, kind of an interesting name, and uh, it's one of the most heavily trafficked uh, shipping lanes in the world, and has been for a very long time, um, since antiquity. So there's, because of that, because of how long people have been sailing there, there's a whole lot of very specific lore to that area that's grown up around it, and I want to see it. And 
tell some stories that are very specific to that area and have Al mess with it or have them mess with Al is more likely. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting set of mythology that's there because it's unique to the geographic space and it's not repeated, which I love because a lot of things get repeated in mythology throughout the world, right? There's a ton of different thunder gods, for example. There's a ton of different hunters and huntresses or whatever. But the Minch has its own thing going on and it doesn't, it's unique. So um, I want to go there. That's going to be a, a thing I do. Um, is in terms of where else I would love to go, um, I would love to get back to Taiwan. Um, I saw just a little fraction of it the one time. I got to go to Taipei, and um, that was a fascinating trip. And a lot of my stuff in, in Scourge with uh, Granny Will going there is a result of that trip. Um, and especially how she grew in her martial art. Um, because while I was there, I was invited to go to the dojo of a martial arts master. He was, he was a, a master of several different disciplines. And he told me he liked my fight scenes. I'm like, really? Oh, my God. Yeah, so would you like to come over to my dojo and I'll teach you a couple of things? I'm like, would I? Yeah. <laughs> so I go with him and he actually teaches me a little bit of stuff with the a sword, a samurai sword. He had me practice with a wooden one first. And then when he figured out I had my form ready, he gave me a real one. And um, a lot of it is about, you know, your stance and your breath. I learned so much about how your state of mind and your breathing are a really important part of being successful in a battle. And then how difficult that is to actually kind of summon that discipline on command, because when you're in a battle, a lot of your endocrine systems and everything else is like, Wah! you know, no discipline, run or fight. Right. So you have to really train a lot to be able to summon that in the passion of a moment. Right. So, I got this sorted and he had a tatami mat, like a grass mat that was woven. And uh, the theory is, is that this, the tensile strength or whatever of this grass mat is supposed to mimic uh, the strength of a human limb. So if you can cut through this mat, you can sever somebody's arm or whatever, or their neck or whatever. So, so I'm like, yeah, it's just grass. I'm just going to do this thing. He was teaching me. It's going to be cool. And he, he, beforehand, he was like, yeah, give it a try. Don't worry about it. And hardly anybody ever gets this right. It's, it's really tough. It's tougher than it looks. I sliced through that sucker the first time, first try, just whoosh. And, and he was like, whoa. And, and I was also like, whoa, <laughs> this is really dangerous. And, and um, I, I, yeah, I kind of freaked out a little bit. I never got a good cut after that, which also taught me something that your, your state of mind is a huge part of you. You really have to kind of go blank a little bit and, and not, be thinking about what could happen or what will happen. You have to be focused on your goal and, and being, you know, correct in your movements. And that's the only way you'll be successful. So, yeah, I learned a ton from that trip. That was just remarkable. And a lot of it wound up making it into the book. He taught me how dangerous the, the staff could actually be um, because the way it's often portrayed in movies and such like that is uh, it's defensive. Mm. it's very offensive uh, because what they do is you tap your weapon away really quickly uh, whether it doesn't matter what weapon you have they tap it away really fast and then they're pivoting their arms or their wrists or whatever and then they, they get you between the eyes with the end of their staff you're done um, it's so fast like he <laughs> he, he did it to me, obviously in slow motion or stopping before he actually hit me, but I'm looking at this thing. I was like, okay, like, yeah, I would have been dead super fast if I was in a battle with this guy. So it, it taught me um, that Granuel would be super, super deadly uh, with her staff because, you know, Atticus would not have trained her to hold back. So there you go. There you have it. Lovely. Yes. Oh, research trip to the Mediterranean, uh, Egypt or Greece. Um, I don't have any, but dang, now that you say it, <laughs> why don't I? I should. Um, I had one uh, plan to go to uh, New Zealand and stuff, but unfortunately that was, uh, that, that was 
in 2020. <laughs> we all know what happened there. I was supposed to go in April of 2020, and then all of the air flights shut down, everything shut down. So I had to cancel all that stuff. And uh, instead, what happened, this was for research for paper and blood. And um, instead, I had a, a, an author friend who lives in uh, Sydney go around and she actually went out hiking and you know took video for me so that i could see all the places that i was that i had planned to go scout so she actually did my scouting for me and you know narrated the whole time in her very charming australian accent and it was wonderful so um it, it complete with things like all right so that fish right over there there are probably brown snakes and i'm not going to go over there because i don't want to die <laughs> and, and so, so yeah like, incredibly you know uh dangerous animals there but she knew where they were and um that was useful information for me too like because she was also a writer she was telling me things that i needed to know here's what it smells like here here's what i can hear you that the phone is probably not picking up you know stuff like that so that was very cool so i always look for things like that like when i went to uh oregon to um on the way down here, I, I, I took time out and location scouted some stuff for the novella. Um, specifically, this one stretch of river, I wanted to see what it was like because I could see it on Google Maps, but I'm like, I have no idea what it's actually like until I go there. And what I found out is that it was silent. It was so, uh, like, sort of deep and there were no rocks disturbing it or anything like that, that it might as well have been a pond or a lake. So... Um, that would have been awkward if I had been describing, tried to describe the sound of the river without being there, because everybody would be like, uh, no, there's no sound in that river right there. So you, there's no, there's no real, you know, substitute for going to a place. Uh, you have to exist in the space to really be able to appreciate it. Google Maps is wonderful in a lot of ways, but it won't get the whole job done, you know. So we got time for one more question. If anyone has a great one, <laughs> it's okay if you have a bad one too. I we'll take those two. Yeah, I, I, I forgive you. So I followed you on social media for a long time, and I really like copied a lot of your mixology. Thank okay. You. <laughs> wow. All right. Thanks. So, what's your favorite? Like, what are you mixing up these days? That's like your favorite tasty beverage. Oh wow. Um, <laughs> so um, I've been like discovering that ginger beer is varied, and and there are different ones uh, that that. Some of them are pretty terrible, um, but you don't know until you try. Um, so I like dark and stormies, which are a pretty basic thing. But um, if you use a really good dark rum, um, like Gosling Seal is a pretty good dark rum. There's a couple of other good ones out there. Um, then uh, you use uh, fresh lime juice. Never that stuff in the plastic squeezy bottle. You gotta use, or you know, you gotta use a fresh lime, right? Uh, I square, I squeeze a half one of those in there, um, and then you you squeeze it all in there, and then you just kind of upend it so it floats. So I got yourself a little lime boat, and um, then uh, the ginger beer that you add in. So is is going to be important because there's some spicy ones out there, and there's some. Other, they always have a little bit of spice, but some of them are super duper spicy. So it just depends. So I kind of like those dark and stormies. They're very simple to make, but they're also delicious. And then the real trick is if you make it with chocolate rum. So there's one that's available in Canada that's probably not available here. You're gonna have to find something else. I'm sorry, you have to find your own chocolate rum. But up in Canada, it's called Mar Bleu, Mar Bleu, uh, and. Uh, I love the label because it's a whale that has like, you know, it's got a spoon coming out of its blowhole. And on top of the, of the spoon is a bottle. You know, it, it, apparently it just manifested this bottle out of its blowhole. <laughs> I love that imagery. I'm like, yeah, magic rum whale you're amazing you know so um it, it's got a it's it's a chocolate flavored rum so you have this chocolate flavored rum as your base and then you put the ginger beer with it and the lime it's like oh, there's magic happening so super drinkable and dangerous yeah there you go all right everyone i would like you to all please give kevin a nice round of applause thank you kevin this is wonderful thank you so much thank you appreciate y'all
Thanks, everybody at home. Yes. Uh, okay, everyone who's joining us virtually, I am sorry, but we are ending our broadcast because we're going to go ahead and begin the in-store signing portion. Take care, y'all. Don't forget, you can still order your own copies either online or if you want personalization, I recommend giving us a call right now. Thank you.